Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to C4C Apologetics. I'm your host, Danny, and we have another interview today. And today, again, we have Dr. Charlie Bing. He's got a THM and a PhD from DTS. That's a lot of acronyms, a THM and a PhD from DTS. And uh, so uh, he spent a lot of time in, in seminary, and he's the director of Grace Life Ministries, which is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the purpose of Grace Life Ministries is to get the grace message really globally, if you will, and just uh, do that through teachings, through books, through conferences. You even have an app as well. Correct me if I'm wrong. Grace Life app. Yeah, you got it. So mm -hmm. uh, be sure to check out the the app, the ministries, things like that. Uh, thank you for being with us again, Dr. Bing. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is a lot of people have some questions about some difficult passages within the Bible, and mostly these are going to be in the New Testament for today, which I did stick one Old Testament uh, passage in there, which was more for my sake, not the viewers, if you will. But before we actually get into the verses and the passages, uh, Dr. Bing, would you like to share anything about yourself, your ministry, family, anything before we actually jump in? Well, uh, I'm here based in Texas, uh, Grace Life Ministries has was started in 1997 and I've been full time with them since 2005 pastored while I started it. Mm -hmm. And you're, you pretty much nailed our purpose and we do have an app, um, which is new and helps people put a lot of resources at their fingertips. Mm -hmm. It's technically called GL ministries because okay. the name grace life was taken, but, um, and you know, why don't I just preempt this by saying a lot of the answers to your questions are going to be found in my books and on the website in my grace notes section so if people want more in-depth details you'll probably get it there than you will on the podcast or or youtube but uh daniel thanks for having me it's good to see you again good to be with you again yeah i've, I've been to that website numerous times i love the search function on it you can just type in the verse and up pops a lot of articles and there's a lot of in-depth information i just recently got on there about revelation 3 5 as far as the passage where it says and i will not blot out your name and so i got a lot of great information from your writing as well so definitely grace life ministries uh right grace life ministries and uh, check that out do the searches and get answers to all your theological questions yeah, by charlie <laughs> and others so no, I, I, my, my lane is pretty narrow. I try to focus on the gospel of salvation and grace and things related to grace. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't get into a lot of prophecy and things like that. There's so many other people doing that and doing a better job than I would. No, I definitely understand that. When I first got into Christian apologetics, it was like, I was trying to have my hand dabbled in all realms of, uh, presuppositional, evidential, experiential, classical apologetics. Then I realized that most people, while they know a lot about a lot, they're a master of really one wheelhouse, if you will. And so yeah. really trying to narrow that down. So I definitely understand what you're saying as far as just the gospel message. And really the most important aspect is the gospel message. That's right. Before we actually get into these, uh, if you will, oft asked questions, questions i do want to ask you and this is covered uh, i want to say it's in your salvation discipleship book and others that you have how can we discern between a passage that is talking about everlasting life or discipleship how can we discern in these passages what's talking about spiritual salvation and something physical salvation or discipleship thoughts well first of all when you're reading the new testament this is one of the most important distinctions you can make the difference between the conditions for salvation and the conditions for discipleship. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to follow Jesus? And there are really, there are really two different things. Of course, they're related and connected, but they're two different things. I think the most important thing, first of all, to understand is what grace is. What is the definition of grace? Mm -hmm. If we see grace as totally unmerited, unconditional, uh, absolutely excluding works. In fact, uh, the opposite of works, then we cannot do anything to earn it. We can't merit it in any way. Mm -hmm. However, when you read many passages in the Gospels, especially about discipleship, mm -hmm. you find many conditions and things you have to do. And we'll, I think we're going to talk about some of those later. Right. So uh, it has to be talking about something besides salvation or else Ephesians 2, 8, 9 doesn't make sense. We're saved mm -hmm. by grace through faith, not by works. Right. So the key to interpreting the passages and distinguishing between salvation and discipleship really starts with the context. 
And that's what I try to do in my book, Grace, Salvation, Discipleship, mm -hmm. and is go to the context and help people build confidence that they can understand from the Bible what it is saying. Because I believe the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And <laughs> yeah. instead of running to different commentaries, pulling them off the shelf, people have a lot of theological biases. Why not see for yourself, first of all, what who Jesus is talking to? Mm -hmm. What is he talking about? Understand the purpose of why he why a book or letter is written mm -hmm. what are the words that are used what are the figures of speech do some comparisons all the all the skills of bible study methods mm -hmm. but start with the context it is key context is always key that's <clears throat> excellent definitely uh, i love how simply you put it in the fact that if everlasting life eternal life is a free gift then the passages where it's talking about having to do something uh, isn't talking about how to receive the free gift of eternal life because then in essence, it's not free. There's strings attached, and that's contrary to what Scripture is saying. We're going to have a link to your book, Salvation and Discipleship, in the descriptions of the video. So if anybody wants Great to check it out, yeah. I definitely encourage you to go buy that book. It makes it very clear as far as that's concerned. Uh, I do want to jump into some verses. The first one's right off the bat. It's a very common one that's regularly misinterpreted, and it's in Luke chapter 14, verse number 12, 27. Where Jesus says, and whosoever doesn't bear, bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Again, you made it very clear as far as the fact on eternal life is a free gift, not of works, period. So what is Jesus actually talking about? Because it sounds like to many people, you have to carry a cross to be a Christian. What are your thoughts? Well, that particular phrase about we must carry a cross to be his disciples is also found in Luke 9, 23. Mm -hmm. And then also in Matthew chapter 10, verse 38 through 39. So uh, it's used in a number of places. First of all, we have to understand what it means to carry the cross. The cross would denote to people uh, at least suffering for Jesus, maybe even mm -hmm. the willingness to die for him because the cross always stood for uh, death. Mm -hmm. So it's identifying with Jesus in a way that causes us to suffer or maybe invites persecution. That's how I would define it. Mm -hmm. So a person to follow Jesus and be his disciple must be willing to suffer for him by mm -hmm. identity with him, maybe even unto death. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, what I what that then excludes it from a condition for salvation, because as we said, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says we're saved by grace through faith, right. not by anything we do. And that includes carrying our cross. Uh, so when you think about it, salvation is about Jesus carrying his cross for us. Mm -hmm. and what he did on the cross discipleship is about us carrying our cross for him as a response mm -hmm. to what he's done for us when we understand what he's done for us for us and going and dying on the cross for our sins and we trust in him as our savior mm -hmm. then we should have the gratitude and love towards him <laughs> that it causes us to want be willing to suffer for him as well in fact, I, I like to start with uh, usually Luke 9 mm -hmm. and, and quote it there because in that context, uh, Luke 9, 23, he says, don't die yourself, take up your cross and follow me right. if you want to be his disciple. But in the preceding verses, he mm -hmm. talks about he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. Mm -hmm. So in essence, what he's saying is, look, here's what I'm going to do for you, disciples. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to die for you. Now, if you really want to be my follower then you need to be willing to die for me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you what that means by going to the cross. Mm -hmm. And so another interesting thing about the Luke passage, the way it puts it is it says, you must take up your cross daily. Yeah. That's a clear indication that it can't be talking about salvation because then we'd have to be saved every day. Yeah, That just doesn't make sense. But yet um, people still make that a condition for salvation. It is clearly a condition for discipleship. One more thing I'd like yeah. to say if we were to look at the Matthew 10 mm -hmm. uh, passage in verse 39, where he mentions it, uh, he it's also following where he mentions you must hate your family members if you want to be oh, my disciple. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so clearly that can't be a condition for discipleship. Right. And he says in both verses, 38, 39, unless you hate your family, you're not worthy of me. Unless you take up your cross, you're not worthy of me. Mm -hmm. when no sinner is worthy of jesus christ and nothing a sinner can an unsaved person can do can make them worthy of christ right. so he can't be talking about worthy of salvation when he says worthy of me he means he's worthy of being a follower yeah. of him so i think it's it's really clear there in those passages what he's talking about 
Now, would it be true that while all disciples are Christians, not all Christians are disciples? Would that be a fair statement? Yeah, I think that's absolutely fair and, and true because there are examples in the New Testament of those who weren't following Jesus, and yet mm -hmm. it was clear they were Christians. And we can right. cite a number of examples, and I do in various places. Yeah. Well, uh, so that one, while it's misunderstood by many people, kind of simplistic, this next one I've actually heard from a, I want to say a covenant theologian or specifically a Lordship Salvationist view in the fact that a Christian must produce good works to verify they're a Christian. This passage in 2 Corinthians 5.17, where Paul says and writes, if any man's a new creation, uh, uh, behold, all things all things are passed away and all things have become new. And so if you're a new creation in Christ, then you're not going to have this sin nature or this propensity to sin or this desire to sin anymore. So a lot of times people will take that verse and teach lordship salvation. Is that what it's saying? Or what does Paul actually mean? If you are new in Christ, all things have become new. Yeah, you're you're right that some people do interpret it that way. That all things become new means that you'll have a new life and you'll live a new life and it will be very evident to all. Mm -hmm. Now, now, I want to clarify this by, by saying that I believe that all Christians who trust in Jesus as their Savior mm -hmm. uh, have a constitutional change. They're a new creation. creation. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a new creature. They're born again. And now I'm saying this, but I can't prove it. I do believe mm -hmm. that all Christians probably have good works. Okay. But right. since we're not with them 24-7, we can't prove it. Uh, right. we, we don't know. what. And good works are not only what we do. Sometimes it's what we not do, what we don't true, do. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I didn't say the bad word that I wanted to say be before I was <laughs> saved, you know, something like that. So what I'm saying is it's impossible to prove by your works that you are a Christian. So to use Second Corinthians 517 in that way, right? it's it you can't make an argument that way. Uh, even and when you look at the context, it becomes clear of what he's saying. Mm -hmm. First of all, he says uh, we are new creations. That's true. He says old things pass away. Well, some people want to say that the old things are the sin nature, although some would say we still have a sin nature, mm -hmm. but they're saying that old sins pass away and the old self passes away. Okay. But is that what he's talking about? And then when he says all things become new, I don't think he can be talking about conduct because Christians do re retain not only their sin capacity or nature, some would say, right. I believe some people believe they don't, Christians don't have a sin nature, but Christians still sin, so there's a capacity to sin. Right. We don't get a new personality. We don't get new habits. And sometimes we still continue to, well, always we still continue to sin. Right. So when he says all things become new, I don't think it's a reference to our conduct and our nature. Mm -hmm. What then is he talking about when he says all things become new? Right. I think he's talk, saying that there's in Christ, we have a new standing, a new position. Mm -hmm. That gives us a new perspective of who Christ is. Okay. And um, so I'm going to look at the scripture here. Yeah. And I think in the context, it's pretty clear because verse 16, the verse before that says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh or as simply human. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh as a human, mm -hmm. yet now we know him thus no longer. Paul was saying beforehand, we knew a guy named Jesus, according to the flesh, he was a man. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we don't think of him that way anymore. We now mm -hmm. think of him as Savior and okay, Lord. Right. And and so what has changed is, is Paul is saying, is not his conduct and not his nature, but what has changed is his perspective, perspective. in how he sees Jesus and how he sees other people. Yeah. So you see 16 says, from now on. And then verse 18 says, the verse after verse 17 says, mm -hmm. now all things are of God. And verse 20 says, now we are ambassadors for Christ. So what he's saying, verse 18 through 19, is, is that now we understand that we have a ministry of reconciliation. And then mm -hmm. in verse 20, now we understand that we're ambassadors for Christ. So we don't just see him as a mere man anymore. We see him as our, our Lord and Savior that we have to tell other people about. And so now we see right. people without Christ. I mean, so there's a difference and a change and a shift in perspective. And that's what's new, I believe. We see Jesus differently and we see other yeah. people differently. Whereas before we just saw them, him as a man and just saw other people as, I don't know what, whatever, you know, people, people as being people.
So definitely a change in perspective on who he is and that change in perspective should uh, how, allow the Christian to want to do good work so that we can glorify our father, which is in heaven, if you will. Uh, yeah, no, I love it. And it can't be it can't be automatic or else we wouldn't right. have the commands of the New Testament. And even yep. what he says after verse 17 about being ambassadors and sharing the ministry of reconciliation. Right, because Paul says a lot of times he's talking to Christians and saying, you should not do this or you should do this, meaning they have the ability to obey or disobey. You did mention something, but it's always been a question on my mind, really. Uh, you made mention uh, as far as like uh, uh, no longer cussing or withholding cussing, if you will. And so that's that's obviously a good thing. Do you think it's a sin to cuss in your head? I'm just it, I've thought about that before. You know, you don't say it, but it's like it's there. <laughs> uh, we could get into quite a discussion about that because what what does it mean to cuss you know some words in this in the english language are 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 considered cuss words that aren't considered cuss words in other cultures i've found out yeah and even in the english language things tend to shift quite a bit in the use oh, yeah. of our language but we do have to degree that the bible talks about uh, crude and, and rough right. discourse and, and speech so we have to avoid that if you think of the worst word that you know Mm -hmm. and you use it well that would probably fit in that category right right so can we cuss in our heads um <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe i do but and i'm not being proud and boastful but i used to have a foul mouth before i was a christian as a teenager yeah. when i became a christian i have not consciously unless i was quoting someone i have yeah. not consciously cussed mm -hmm. and i i'm not proud of that i'm just saying that 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 is part of me seeing things differently and have a different perspective on how right. I can please the Lord and maybe part of me being a new creation. Um, so Definitely. yeah, oh, you know, sometimes, like uh, well, you know, when we think about sins, people like to right. think about things that we do, mm -hmm. but also sometimes it's sins that we don't do. They're sins of commission and sins of omission. omission. Yep. Uh, did we forget to pray today? Did we forget yeah. to, did we not, witness to that person that God gave us an opportunity to witness to. Those are sins of omission. Yeah. And in the Old Testament, they had sacrifices for both. Yep. So we have to be careful about looking at someone's outward conduct and judging them by that. Oh, definitely. And one thing I try to get across, too, is you can never tell the heart. You can see a Christian doing all these good things, but they might be doing it for selfish and Im Im improper motives, you know, and I don't think exactly. Jesus is going to reward that either. Uh Let's talk a little bit about uh, irresistible grace, if you will, for a minute. In Titus chapter 3, verse number 5, it says that uh, according to the works of righteousness, uh, which we have done, not by the works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing and regeneration of the Holy Ghost. Now, a lot of people will take this verse in Titus 3, 5 and teach a form of monergism in the fact that God has to regenerate the person before they can actually receive the gift of salvation. And it teaches someone is irresistibly drawn. Uh, is that what Titus 3, 5 is saying? Is Or what is Paul telling Titus here in this regard? Okay, well, whenever we talk about salvation, I think we have to look look at it is is the verse speaking about it from god's perspective or from the human perspective mm -hmm. god's perspective is that he shows us his mercy the human perspective is that we we receive it not by works mm -hmm. so implying that it's by faith like mm -hmm. ephesians 2 8 and 9 says um there are some who believe in monergism which which is the belief that god salvation is all of god we don't have really have anything to do with it his grace is irresistible therefore he gives us grace he gives us faith he in a sense makes us believe right. uh, or he makes us born again so that we can believe and we have absolutely nothing to do with it we're a corpse that's what some call corpse theology right uh and so it's everything is of god the the other view that's uh would be contrary to that somewhat is synergism where we cooperate with god's working in other words, in God's sovereignty, he he intended to do certain things, but part of his sovereignty was that he would give us a free will or the ability to respond. Mm -hmm. And so God's sovereignty includes the decree of man's free will. Mm -hmm. So man works together with God in, in this process of salvation. He, he there, There's a, a collusion of wills where... You know, I don't know how to take a knife and separate them, but God, uh, as we'll talk about maybe later, God draws us and woos us and we respond. 
Right. It's not that he drags us along. And so when it's talking about uh, in, in Titus 3, 5, it's not by our works, but God's mercy. Uh, it's both. It's not one or the other. It's <laughs> God who shows us his mercy and his mercy is giving us the gift of salvation as a free gift, mm -hmm. not by our works. Uh, so it looks at it from both perspectives, I think, there, and it's and it doesn't out, uh, um, what I want to say, it doesn't rule out one or the other, either God's perspective or man's perspective. Right. But and it definitely doesn't teach this whole aspect of monarchism or irresistible grace either. I like the aspect where you look at it from both perspectives on what God's doing for man and how man's receiving what God is giving. I really like that. Let's get into a debatable one. Okay. Uh, uh, Aren't they all? <laughs> <laughs> well, some more so than others. Some shouldn't be debatable. You know, like you said, context is king. But Matthew 25, 31 through 46, there's this uh, parable, if you will, of the sheep and the goat judgment, where Jesus goes through a list as far as, as you've done it for this person, you've done it to me, and equates them as sheep and equates others that don't as goats. And then it says later in that passage that the goats are sent to everlasting uh, destruction, I want to say. Uh, can you explain what is the sheep and goat judgment? Is this a literal judgment? And when do you believe it would take take place? Um, yeah, it is a difficult passage, and I've labored over it and uh, probably mm -hmm. shifted my view a little bit, and I'll explain. Mm -hmm. uh, um First of all, let's talk about the timing of it. I believe in the Olivet Discourse. It comes at the end for a reason, because this judgment takes place at the end of the tribulation period. Okay. Uh, there seems to be, if you read the scriptures, uh, a certain amount of time at the end of the tribulation period that that uh, precludes the millennial kingdom. Mm -hmm. And it would happen perhaps in those days. Uh, the sheep and the goats judgment is concerning the nations or the Gentiles. And his reference in that passage to brethren mm -hmm. is to the Jews, I believe, and how okay. they conducted themselves towards the Jews. Uh, the The parables that lead up to this one in mm -hmm. the Olivet Discourse, I think, kind of have a sequence about, and the main theme is being prepared. And so this, as it comes to the end of the tribulation, now it's it's really too late. Everybody has cast their die, so to speak and uh, made their determination now it's time uh, to wield judgment it's time for mm -hmm. jesus to judge we know that in matthew 24 he talks about how the jews are going to be tremendously persecuted revelation 12 through 13 also talks about that mm -hmm. and all those who endure to the end matthew 24 13 the end of the tribulation not to the end of their life mm -hmm. all those who endure to the end of the tribulation will be saved that would include gentiles i believe okay saved from the destruction that Jesus will uh, uh, throw upon the earth when he returns. Mm -hmm. um, so they're going to be persecuted by the Antichrist and all the nations, and Jesus is going to rescue the Jews and then the Gentiles who also endure faithfully with the Jews to the end. Mm -hmm. um, there, the, the one interpretation is, of mm -hmm. course, those who help other people will go into the kingdom of God or go to heaven. Right. And this is often used by the social gospel to say, it's not enough to preach to people. We have to, we have to, Do. you know, feed people, clothe yeah. them and be nice to people in the context though, he's talking about Gentiles and how they treated the Jews. Mm -hmm. And it's not, and I'm going to argue that it's not what secures their salvation, not their actions. Right. Now some, uh, another interpretation is that we see that the gentiles are determined to be saved or unsaved by how they treated the jews okay and this is a very popular uh interpretation even by those who hold to the free grace gospel mm -hmm. and this is a view i probably used to hold because i didn't i wasn't comfortable with it but i, I didn't know what else to what else to see yeah. that they were just showing their faith by how they treated the jews therefore they were determined to be sheep or goats okay. by how they treated the jewish people mm-hmm I think I've come to a little better understanding of this with the help of my friend, Dr. David Anderson. Yeah. That he's talking about the Gentiles and their the judgment of their, their salvation has already occurred. It's not in this passage. 
Okay. They are sheep and goats before this passage, mm-hmm. just like the wheat and the tares grow together until Jesus returns. Right. The sheep and the goats, it's already been determined by their faith in Jesus Christ. It's not mentioned here, but yeah. we're we're assuming that they've already determined their position as a sheep or as a goat mm-hmm. as to how they what they've done with Jesus Christ. And so all Jesus is doing when he separates them is just he's separating them. He's not mm-hmm. determining their salvation. He's right. just separating the sheep and the goats, like he would separate the wheat from the tares. Mm-hmm. So you have three groups of people. You have the unsaved Gentiles, the saved Gentiles, and the Jews, which he calls my brethren, and how right. they treated his brethren. Um, some Jews and Gentiles will live t- until the end of the tribulation period, I believe. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, some of the Jews will go in to inherit the kingdom, he says, they will go mm-hmm. into the kingdom. Uh, they will have everlasting life. And and that's in the last verse in the chapter, but I, I think it's the last verse, verse 46. Yeah. Everlasting life is not just a quantity of life, but a quality of life. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, not, not every believer, of course, has the same quality of life and the same mm-hmm. uh, evidence of their faith or the outworking of their faith. But I think Jesus is speaking in generalities here because these are good, faithful people who have persevered to the end of the tribulation period. Mm-hmm. And so when he speaks favorably of the Jews who treated his brethren, the I mean, the Gentiles who treated his brethren, the Jews, right. kindly, uh, I think that's a general statement that fit the way those Gentile nations lived. And they're going to experience, inherit the kingdom, which I think... Mm. Uh, implies more than just entering it includes entering more than entering but he talks about everlasting life also and everlasting life is not just a quantity of life but a quality of life and then the you have this so you have the saved gentiles and you have the unsaved gentiles and they are thrown into the lake of fire that's easy to understand and uh it's called punished so punished uh, seems to imply that there's degrees of punishment Mm -hmm. just as there could be degrees of inheriting the kingdom there are degrees of punishment for the gentiles that go into the lake of fire um so i think uh i think that's how i see it, it it's not that jesus is judging their salvation by their works mm-hmm. they're already their salvation has already been determined he's mm-hmm. just separating them okay they're coming to him either as believers or unbelievers and he's just separating them mm-hmm. for their fate Okay. So that's how I see it now. If that makes sense, I hope that's kind of clear. No, no, it does. It does definitely, uh, especially when you brought up the the part where uh, they're punished in sort of like different degrees. This would totally align with the Great White Throne Judgment, where the exactly. dead, the unbelievers, are brought up and and they're uh, judged according to their works before they're cast into the lake of fire, which still teaches some aspect of like you have degrees of rewards. You know, I think there's going to be degrees of everlasting death if you will the adolf hitlers were going to have a a worse off than maybe the nice atheist down the road that same location but different degrees is possible but exactly that's why he opens the books and looks at their deeds yeah so great white so let's get back to another uh one that sort of teaches irresistible grace that has quite a variance of interpretation is John chapter 6, verse number 44. What do you believe it means when Jesus says, no man can come unto me except the Father draw him? A lot of times okay. this uh, this is an aspect of a dragging, teaching an irresistible grace aspect. Well, what, it, what is Jesus saying here? And in, in, uh, what are your thoughts? Yes, that verse is popularly used that way to talk about God's irresistible grace yeah. or his dragging. And um, I did a grace notes on this and went into a little bit more detail. Mm-hmm. Now that word, the word used, first of all, let's say yeah. in the context of John chapter six, eternal life was presented as a gift over and over and over. And I could give you the verses, but you, somebody could read through John six yes. and see that he speaks of eternal life as a gift. Mm-hmm. It's a free gift. Now a gift assumes a certain freedom to either accept it or reject it. Mm-hmm. And a gift is motivated by love. That's what John 3.16 teaches us. So you have the gift of God from his love. Mm -hmm. And love is never something that forces a person to do something. That's forced love. I used to have a professor that said forced love is rape. 
Oh. So love yeah. it doesn't force people to do something. It gives them options and he gives us a, a offers us a free gift. And the option is we can yeah. accept it or reject it. So to say, stay consistent with the idea of God's love and God's gift, right. how would we interpret this? Um, the word draw used there can mean to draw or pull something. It can also, it's used five times in the New Testament, four times in John. It can also mean to attract. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and we find that um, more in, um, it's used literally of drawing or pulling somebody or dragging somebody mm -hmm. in, in the New Testament. But it does have the sense of attraction and even a romantic att attraction. If you were to look at uh, the Septuagint translation of Jeremiah three thirteen. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew. Yeah. Um, in the, the Septuagint, you would find, and also in the Song of Solomon, chapter one, verses three through four, yeah. that the word "draw" or the verb "draw" el kuo is used of uh, romantic attraction. And another interesting example not from the scriptures but from the apocryphal writing of fourth maccabees okay. which doesn't disqualify it from being accurate history and it doesn't right. disqualify it from helping us learn how the language is used but we have a couple incidences several incidences or maybe two or three in fourth maccabees where a mother is drawn by love to her sons and that's okay. how the word el kuo is used there so I think that when it's used in John chapter six and verse 44, it's talking about uh, God is uh, drawing people or attracting people right. and he doesn't force them uh, to accept his free gift, but using and working in collusion with mm -hmm. their free, with our free will, he right. presents the gift and we have the freedom to reject it or not. So, I know some people want to argue against free will using this verse and other verses, right. but think about this. If we're not free, if, if man is not free to believe, to accept or reject the gift, mm -hmm. then why did God blind the Jews when they rejected the gospel? If they had no choice yep. or why did he speak in parables to hide the truth? You see, he was covering the truth from them. Uh, because they weren't receptive but but the analogy would be like putting a blindfold on a corpse if a person can't believe on their own or if, if god hasn't given them a, an ability to respond to the gospel at his mm -hmm. prompting then uh and we're just dead corpses then then uh why would he have to uh use parables or uh turn from the Jews in a judicial judgment of, and cause them to be blind. Yeah. So, to speak. so the question then is how does God draw us? Right. Okay. What is, if it's not irresistible grace, how does God draw us? And I think the answer is found in the scriptures. Um, John chapter 12 verses 32 through 33 mm -hmm. says that I'm just par roughly paraphrasing when Jesus right. said, when I, the son of man is lifted up. He'll draw all men to himself. Mm -hmm. So there's something about the cross that is attracting to people. It represents God's love. It represents his sacrifice. It represents forgiveness of sins and maybe many more things to people. Mm -hmm. And that has a drawing power. So that's why we preach the cross. It draws people. But also right here in this verse in John 6, 44, uh, he talks about uh, being taught. Yep. Uh, in verse 44 so let me see if i can get verse 45 is written in the prophets else shall all be taught of god every man that has heard and learned oh, yeah. that the father comes to me you're right you corrected yeah. me. verse 45 every man who is taught mm -hmm. comes to me so it, it now people can be taught and not come to him like judas but right. those who are under his teaching who are open to it response to it, you have to be taught to be open to it so there's teaching involved. There, so there's the cross, there's teaching. And then we know from other scriptures that the Holy Spirit has a con, uh, convincing ministry. Mm -hmm. He convinces us of sin or convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. judgment. Yep. So God takes the word. He takes the cross, the message of the cross, and he uses it to convince us that we're sinners facing judgment and that Jesus mm -hmm. is the righteous one that we have to trust in. 
That's John uh, 16, verses 8 through 11. And there's one more factor I'd throw in there. Yeah. Besides the cross, besides teaching, and besides the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, right? God uses people to draw mm -hmm. people to himself. Romans 10, 14. How can they... How can they believe unless they hear? How can they hear without a preacher? Yep. So the the human element is again part of this, and works in collusion with God's will. <laughs> and the best comparison is is marriage. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure that you didn't drag your wife to the altar. You probably asked her. <laughs> she she asked probably me. were. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I begged <laughs> her. <laughs> you begged her. The point is, is that it was of her own free will. There, yeah. there was a wooing process yeah. where you were attracted to each other and and nothing was forced because that's not love. Right. You asked her or she asked you, it doesn't really matter. But <laughs> at some point you agree. It's really hard to know where the momentum or the gravity was in a situation yeah. of marriage. It could be with you or with your wife right. who felt the strongest, but your, your, your wills colluded with one another. To the point where you it was the natural thing to want to get married i, I think there's a biblical example of this too in acts chapter 16 when paul mm -hmm. goes to philippi right and he goes to the prayer meeting on the river that lydia is conducting mm -hmm. now why was lydia there we don't know something drew her to be a worshiper of god evidently mm -hmm. but she didn't know christ something drew her to be a worshiper of god right. something drew paul to the riverside but when Paul was there, he knew that he had a responsibility to teach them. And so he taught them the gospel. Mm -hmm. And it says that God opened, opened her heart, Lydia's heart. Yep. So there's God working together with the message, with what he's done previously in Lydia's life, with how he directed Paul, with how Paul preached it using human agency and the mm -hmm. word of God and the message of the cross. And through all of that, Lydia believed and a church was started in Philippi. I think that's a good example of what we're talking about when God's will colludes with our free will in a way that, I, again, I can't take a knife and separate that. Yeah, no, I, I like that, especially the analogy as well, because I can remember the times when me and my wife were dating before we got married, engaged, you know, the butterfly feelings, you know, and just the the <laughs> the, the, the inner drive to just see her again and know more about her, if you will. Yeah. So, no, I definitely appreciate that. I, I like when you brought up the Apocrypha, too, because while we wouldn't believe the Apocrypha is inspired, the Apocrypha, uh, at, at least Maccabees, possibly from a possible historical pers perspective, it actually shows how words were used in that day. And so there's value in that. And so exactly. I appreciate and, that. And we look at other literature. We look at uh, other non-scriptural literature yep. in classical Greek and understand to understand how words were used. We do that yep. all the time. Exactly. Yep. So here's here's another one. Uh, now I hold to the ice view, but in Acts chapter two, verse number thirty eight, uh, Peter tells the people there at Pentecost, repent, and be baptized for the remission of sins. And I know there's uh, another quite a difference in opinion as far as what does it mean? Now you get some of the assembly of God and other folks saying, see, you need to repent and you need to be baptized, you know, physically water baptized to be saved. How would you understand that passage from a eternal life is a free gift, but then why is Peter saying you have to be baptized? Can you tell me what you mean when you say you hold to the ice view? Well, uh, EIS, the Greek word where it says oh, oh, be okay. baptized for. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was, I was yeah. Yeah. Good clarification. <laughs> so on the basis of uh, their belief in Jesus Christ, they should be baptized. Right. It's Sorry. like in, instead of uh, one of the words that it could be uh, meaning within the semantic range is because of repent, be baptized yeah. because of the remission of sins, if you will. Right. But I don't know. What are your thoughts? What's your view and, and how do you articulate it? Well, uh, that's a good question. This is a very difficult passage for many mm -hmm. to understand, and it's often misused by baptismal regenerationists. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, you know, first of all, we interpret. We go back to Bible study methods. We interpret difficult passages in light of the clear passages. Yes. We have so many clear passages that tell us salvation is by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're numerous. And even in the book of Acts, we have many examples of people being saved and not being baptized or baptized mm -hmm. later. So um, just by comparing scripture to so many other scriptures, we know that that view 
of baptismal regeneration would be suspect. Right. Now, um, what does it mean then that that uh, uh, they'll be baptized, they'll be forgiven their sins, receive the Holy Spirit? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that one argument is uses, uh, of course, some people believe baptism saves. That's one view. The second view right. is that they use the word uh, ice on the basis of the forgiveness of sins. Right. That's why you should be baptized. Uh, so it's a causal use of, of the preposition ice mm -hmm. in the Greek language. Uh, and I used to hold that view, so I'm not critical of it. Uh, okay. It's a simple one to explain. However, there are many people who argue that that's a debatable use of the preposition ice. Okay. And yeah. so I've okay. I've kind of looked uh, for a little different explanation. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. and here's another explanation. Mm -hmm. um, these Jews. And remember the audience is Jewish, right? And G and this is the Pentecostal sermon, so Peter's preaching this right after Jesus is crucified, right? And they are, and he tells them that they have crucified their Savior. And in verse uh, thirty-six, let all the house of Israel, Jews, assuredly know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Mm -hmm. So. He's telling them, that, hey, you just killed the Messiah. And verse 20, 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Right. Now, it depends on what you, what weight you put on that phrase, they were cut to the heart. Mm -hmm. Where they were either sorry that they killed their Messiah, period, or cut to the heart means that they we're sorry that they killed the Messiah and they're now trusting in him as savior. Oh, right. Uh, but, but I think the second view is that they realize that they, they crucified them as savior. So they must believe in him and to escape judgment on the generation that killed Jesus Christ. They need to be baptized and identify with the Christian community mm -hmm. uh, and show their rejection of the old Jewish system. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what baptism would signify a new identity uh, of something visible, something mm -hmm. physical to show that they're now identifying with the Christian community because their sins, because their sins have been forgiven. Mm -hmm. And then the Holy Spirit will be given to them. And we, we need to be careful how we treat the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts because it's a transitional mm -hmm. book. Yes. And sometimes the Holy Spirit yeah. is given immediately and sometimes it's delayed. And yeah. always there was an apostle present. When the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit was bestowed on someone. So that's not the norm for today, even though people want to make it that. Another interpretation um, is that cut to the heart shows that they realize that they need to change their mind about who Jesus is. They okay, realized right. for the first time when Peter preached to them that they crucified their Messiah and they, yeah. they were cut to the heart or sorrowful or hurt by that. But when he says repent, Peter is then saying, now you need to change your mind about what you're going to do with Jesus. Mm. And so that's a challenge to them to change their minds about him as Savior and receive his free gift of eternal life or forgiveness right? and the Holy Spirit with that. So that view kind of separates the cutting of the heart of being regretful uh, to you know, the command to repent or means to change your mind about who Jesus is now. Now mm. that you're sorry that you killed him, what are you going to do with him? All right. How are you going to think about it and what are you going to do? Now, where does the word baptism fit there? A baptism would then show their repentance uh, and their change of mind about Jesus Christ. And again, mm -hmm. their faith that identifies them with the new community. And so baptism becomes a visible display of what they've done on the inside and how they've changed their mind about him on mm -hmm. their inside. Um, you know, that the interesting thing about the passage is when he says, uh, um, verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right. When he says repent, that's in the plural. You all repent, to use some good mm. Texas language. You all repent. <laughs> right. And, and, and then at the end, he says, you all will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, now the command mm. to be baptized is in the singular. Yeah. So it's almost parenthetical. We're showing us that it's not crucial to them being forgiven or receiving the Holy Spirit. Hmm. It would, and I'm trying to think. I've tried to th think of an example, yeah. and it may not be the best one. But okay. let me try it on you. If I said, if I said to a group of people, "Y'all get on the bus, and I'll take you to Disneyland." <laughs> Well, let's put it this way. Y'all take on the bus and every one of you sit down and I'll get you to Disneyland. I don't want to go to Disneyland. <laughs> you know, I don't either. Really. <laughs> but I know what you're saying. Yeah. No desire. Just picking a popular place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, I'm not saying two different things. Y'all get on the bus and every one of you sit down. Something specific to do. Mm -hmm. I'm addressing each person. Yeah. Each of you sit down, but y'all get on the bus. So the general right. command is y'all get on the bus. Y'all will uh, get to Disneyland. Y'all repent. Y'all will receive the Holy Spirit. But be baptized yeah. for the forgiveness of sins because you just killed the Messiah. And you don't want to be identified with this generation. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a parenthetical thing, telling them how to escape, uh, I think, temporal punishment because of their sin being in that generation that crucified the Messiah. Mm. So you think it's, that makes uh, sense to you? No, it, it does. Uh, you you believe it's looking forward to the eighty seventy judgment on that generation? Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I can see that too. Rome destroyed Jerusalem. Yeah, right. And, and I can see that too because those that were of John's disciples and got baptized uh, were baptized, and they followed Messiah. You know, when he was preaching his baptism of repentance, where for the third time we're going through life of Messiah by Arnold Fruitenbaum and very clear as far as the purpose of John's uh, baptism there. And those that were baptized by John became later uh, Christians, uh, if you will, believers in Messiah. Like you said, some people got saved and, and weren't baptized till later and received the Holy Ghost until later because who is it? Paul uh, went out and later in the book of Acts, he says, under what were you baptized? And they said by John's baptism and they didn't hear of any other type of baptism. And so, no, I thought that was really clear. And I'm no Greek scholar, and so I just, like you said, uh, Occam's razor, simplicity uh, with the ice Greek word because of. But the more I'm looking at this, the more I do want to look at this and equate this with uh, the baptism of John and it being a transitional period and the fact that history doesn't formulate doctrine. It just illustrates it, that whole principle. And so, no, I appreciate that. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm not play... necessarily a Greek scholar either, but I have listened to some of them who have questioned yeah. the use of ice in that way. However, saying that mm -hmm. that's a good explanation. If you can make it work, the one right. we all would reject is that baptism saves us. Right. So definitely the, the other interpretations yep. that we gave, at least keep the gospel free. Right. Because even dispensationalists, while some people want to claim that dispensationalists have a they change their, they say that there's a work required in the past to be saved. Uh, that's not what dispensationalism teaches. And we would never use Acts chapter two, verse 38 to teach that you had to repent and be baptized to receive eternal life. Uh, that's not what we would, you know, teach repent. Like you said, change your mind on who Messiah is and, and what you need to do with that. But baptism never going to be a work for requirement for salvation. And so I right. uh, appreciate that. Okay. Uh, second Peter chapter one, verse number 10, Peter writes in, in that letter, he says uh, to make your calling and your election. Sure. Now, a lot of people want to take this verse and teach that you got to look at yourself, look at your works to make sure that you're a genuine Christian or that you're on the path for final salvation. Uh, what, what is Peter saying here? Many people use this, as you say, to make sure you how to know you're one of the elect, mm -hmm. which, according to the Calvinistic system, uh, you really can't ever be sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. And they want to they want to say by your conduct, probably you can you can make sure you're one of the elect. But that contradicts the P in their tulip, because the P says you have to persevere to the end of your life right. to make sure you're one of the elect. Yep. So it's a contradiction to use that passage in this way. It's a contradiction in their system to begin right. with. But uh, let me let me use the context a little bit. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yes. 
if if it, if he's talking about salvation, then he's saying that your works prove your election. But as I said, that doesn't make much sense in view of their view of perseverance, right? And in view of the fact that works are so subjective and relative, as we've already said, that you can't use it as a test of salvation. They can be an evidence or an indication right. of salvation, but there are many non-Christians who live a more moral life than Christians. Yeah. Um. So he's in this context. I don't think he's talking about the fact of entering the kingdom. But mm -hmm. the quality of entering. Okay, uh, right. And I'll, uh, I'll talk about why. First of all, he's talking to Christians. He makes that real clear in verse one to those who have obtained like precious faith uh, with us by the righteousness of God, our Savior. So that's very clear there. Verse three, mm -hmm. it's very clear he's talking to Christians when he says, Divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his glory, called us by glory and virtue, and other indications in the following verses right i won't take the time to read them the point is, is that peter never is questioning their salvation there's no indication that the readers of this epistle are questioning their salvation mm -hmm. so there's no reason for him to give them a test or or a challenge to prove their salvation right in fact when we when we read further we find out in verses eight and nine that christians those who have these things and he tells them to add to their virtues all these different their faith all these different virtues as qualities in verse uh, five yes. through seven and but on the other hand there are those who can be blind and barren of fruit mm -hmm. and blind and he talks about them in verses eight and nine so christians again have two paths they can walk one is the path of adding virtue to your faith or one is the other is the path of uh, ignoring virtue and living in sin right. to some degree um so when he says in verse 10 therefore uh since christians can have and behave in a contradictory way mm -hmm. uh, how do you want to make your salvation and election sure well let's talk about that the word sure can mean certified or confirmed mm -hmm. or validated by evidence okay um it doesn't necessarily mean as, as strong as prove mm. it just means to, to show the evidence of something mm -hmm. and then who is he who would we show evidence to i don't think it's to peter i don't think it's to the readers themselves but i think he's talking about confirming your calling election to those around you mm -hmm. um, by your by your good behavior others will see i would use an analogy of james chapter 2 verses 21 through 25 Mm -hmm. where he talks about Abraham's faith and he was justified by his works. Right. In other words, other people saw his works of sacrificing Isaac and they called him a friend of God. Right. He wasn't justified before God by his works, but he was justified in view of, uh, in other people who viewed him. Right. So in view of the false teachers that he's going to talk about in the next chapter, you can show people that you're, you're saved. Um, and you can evidence that by um, the things that you do. So if you do these things, you'll never never stumble. Mm -hmm. And then he talks about the entrance into the kingdom in verse 11. For so an entrance will, will be supplied to you abundantly, abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He doesn't say if you do these things, you'll enter heaven, mm -hmm. but you an, an abundant entrance will be supplied to you. And the verb supplied is in the passive, meaning that it will be bestowed upon them. Mm -hmm. I take it as a reward that they will receive. And I think it draws to mind the cultural equivalent of uh, a triumphant general or athlete was given a, uh, a parade, mm. a victory parade when yeah. they entered the city. They didn't enter through a side gate. They entered through the main gate, mm -hmm. an abundant entrance. And if, if you're faithful and you add to your faith these virtues, Choose. You won't mm -hmm. be blind and barren, but you'll receive an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. A, re a reward is what he's speaking of. Um, the other thing I think is important to note is the okay. word order. When he says, make your call and election sure. Mm -hmm. Now, if this were speaking of divine election as God selecting us, right? then it's the wrong order. According to Romans 8.30, which the strong Calvinists would also use. Yeah, because God elects us and then he chooses us before time and then he calls us. 
-hmm. But this doesn't say elect make your election and calling shirt. It says make your calling and election shirt. Mm. So I take it this way that God invites. And by the way, that that order is of phrasing is used in Matthew 20, uh, verse 16 and 22, verse 14. Mm. Yeah. In passages that talk about rewards. So I take it this way, that God invites all into his kingdom. Um, just like in those passages in Matthew, he invites all to work. He invites all to the wedding feast. But only a few or a limited number get the rewards for their work or for being properly dressed at the wedding feast. Right. By their dressed by their deeds, I take it. So those are rewards passages also. Um. And and that's where the word order, and that's where Jesus uses the word order. Many are called, but few are chosen, chosen. which is the idea of election. Right. So many are invited in these parables, but only a few are chosen for rewards. And I take that word order as suiting the Christian life. Many mm -hmm. are invited uh, by God to the gift of salvation or to the Christian life, mm -hmm. but but. Um, uh, not everybody is chosen for rewards. So make your calling and re your rewards uh, evident to others by the things that you do is the way I would take it. And then you'll have a triumphant entry into the kingdom. You know, I, I like that, especially when we get the concept of inheriting the kingdom and this entrance, if you will, and that not every Christian is going to have a a uh, the same entrance, you know, based upon, you know, how we serve Jesus once we get saved. I was fascinated by the word order focus you had as far as calling an election versus elect and called, if you will. So that was fascinating as well. Let's look at Galatians. Galatians chapter five, verse number four. Now, to me, it's okay. kind of kind of comical and humorous in a sense when whether it's Arminians that use this or reform use this that teach that you can lose your salvation or you never had it, whatever. Because he's clearly teaching, it seems like he's clearly teaching against legalizers. Uh, but it says in verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whoever you are, you're if you're justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Uh, what does Paul mean here when he's telling the Galatian churches that they're fallen from grace? Okay, that's another another difficult passage for people. And of course, one interpretation is people say that you can lose your salvation. Um, the, the thing is, is it doesn't say how you can lose your salvation here. If it does, or if it does, it's that because you're not keeping the law. And, <laughs> right. uh, and, and that would be how you lose your salvation. But uh, we know, first of all, that Paul is writing to Christians. He says that clearly in his introduction, if we would go back and read verses mm -hmm. two through four, verses nine. The, he's writing to those who are believers. He planted the church in Galatia. We also know that there's false teachers there who are teaching from all appearances that you, you, yeah, you have to believe in Jesus, but you also have to keep the Old Testament law. Right. And that comes out in a number of places. And that's what Paul calls a different gospel than what he mm -hmm. preached. And, and uh, for example, chapter three and verse one, oh, foolish Galatians, who has be bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ, Christ was clearly clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Uh, so somebody has bewitched them. And then let's see, in the chapter five and verse seven, mm -hmm. uh, it says, you ran well who hindered you from obeying the truth. So they have these influences on them. But the fact that they're Christians is very clear in verse one, chapter five, verse one, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. So he's talking to the Galatian Christians who have been freed uh, from mm -hmm. the law. And he's and there are those who are tempting them to be back under the law. Mm -hmm. uh, the example uh, it would be Peter they use in chapter two, where Peter was obviously saved by grace and, and preached that. But yet when. Uh, mm. Jews came to visit, he stopped eating with the Gentiles. He was being right. a hypocrite. Yeah. And Paul said in that context, I do not set aside the grace of God. Mm. To go back under the law is to set aside the grace of God. When you right. set aside the grace of God, you don't set aside salvation as a Christian. You set aside the blessings that grace can bring us. 
Okay. Yeah. So I think that this passage is addressing not their position. Their position is made clear over and over again that they are believers, that they know Christ as Savior, mm -hmm. that the law has led them to Christ, 324. The law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Mm -hmm. They were justified by faith. Um, but now, he says, so they're free, verse 1, chapter 5. Uh, do, don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He said, don't go back under the law and get all under that bondage of the law. And it's always a bondage because we can never live up to it. The law meant yeah. death, not life. If it meant bondage not freedom right he wants them to maintain their liberty and their freedom um indeed if i paul say to you that if you become circumcised that's the symbol of being under the law mm -hmm. christ will profit you nothing in other words if you're going to depend on your own works under the law then then christ is really of no benefit to you e even as a christian i mean you'll have salvation but you won't have any other benefits because mm -hmm. we're to live by grace through faith mm -hmm. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised, he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Yeah. Okay, you want to go back under the law? Christ is no benefit. Now you got to keep the whole law. Mm -hmm. If that's what you're really depending on for uh, your salvation and your sanctification, then you need to keep all of it. Uh, so let's let's be consistent. Right. And, and then verse 4 is where he says, you've become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Right. Um, so... The word estranged there means to be, it can mean to render something inoperative, something mm -hmm. powerless, or, um, yeah, something uh, useless. Uh, and so when he says you've become estranged from Christ, you cut yourself off from his power. His power is no longer operative mm -hmm. in your life because why? You're depending on your own power of keeping the law. Mm -hmm. And you've fallen from grace. Now, when he says fallen from grace implies that they were once adhered to grace because mm -hmm. right, you have to true. be with something to fall from it. Mm -hmm. So it implies that they were in a position of grace. And if you fall out of that position uh, by resorting to your works of the law, then you've fallen from that position of blessing. And so I think what he's warning them is that if you go back under the law, you will cut yourself off of the blessings of living under grace where God gives things as a gift, empowers mm -hmm. you. Because you're not depending on his power anymore. You're depending on your own power. Hmm. So if you attempt to be justified, it's interesting that he says, uh, Christ, uh, you come estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified hmm. by law. Now, the word attempt is is supplied in the New King James Version. Okay. But right. um, if, the, if they were to, uh, and probably because the understanding is you, you can only attempt to be justified by the law no one is actually justified by the law you can only attempt or try True, to be right. justified by the law so if you teach that that justification comes through keeping the law if you go back to teaching that and to, and then try to keep the law in order to be sanctified because he said you receive the spirit by faith uh what verse is that yep. um you uh verse five no yeah. for through the spirit no we wait spirit through faith well, geez, it's left my head, but uh, <laughs> yes, you receive the spirit through faith. So why do you want to be justified through the law is what he says yep. somewhere. Here. No, that's that's um, the Galatians 3, too. When you yeah, talk about three, being bewitched. Yeah. So you receive the yeah, spirit man. by the works of the law or by hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, you have now made perfect. And that's really the point of the whole thing. I should have, so I really should have co correlated that earlier, but on my head's all in chapter five. <laughs> if you've begun in the spirit through faith, Mm -hmm. How can you be perfect by the flesh by keeping the law? Right. It's impossible. You cut yourself off from all the benefits of God's grace walking through faith. That's right. what Ephesians, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 5, 2 is telling us that we have access to this grace through faith. faith. And so faith opens up the doors of God's power, provision, mm -hmm. everything that he has as a free gift that meets our needs as undeserving <laughs> sinners and undeserving Christians also. Yeah. Um, but they would cut themselves off from that. So falling from grace is a positional thing. I'm mean, not a positional thing practical. where they fall out of Christ and lose their salvation, but right. a practical thing where mm -hmm. they, they can't complete their salvation, their sanctification process by resorting mm -hmm. back to the law. Right. No, definitely. I love how you 
articulating the fact that it's grace in the fact that Jesus has power in us and that we're being estranged from his power since we're trying to do it all of ourselves. I only have two left. Now I'm going to save the best one for the last one, if that's okay. So, but this next one's Luke chapter 12. This one, you know, caused me a little bit of trouble. And it's the reason why I wanted to bring this one up is because atheists love this verse. And they only really love this verse because to them, they see this as God being a malevolent uh, murderer, if you will. And so in Luke chapter 12, verse number 46, uh, there's this parable of stewards. And in verse 46, it says, The Lord of the servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him in pieces. And will appoint his portion with unbelievers. Now, the reason why atheists love this is because uh, obviously we argue that scripture teaches about the love, mercy, and grace of God. And the reason why they like it is because they look at this and they're like, see, he's cutting this person up in pieces and casting him away. That's not a loving God. Uh, But uh, outside of the uh, Christian apologetic side, uh, theologically, uh, what is this talking about? Well, I doubt that atheists have very good Bible study methods ingrained in them. <laughs> well, and I would agree with that too. <laughs> and that's why they come up with this. And one of the one of the main things about interpreting parables, which is what this is, is a parable, mm-hmm. is that you want to look for the main point and you don't want to make all the details walk on all fours, so mm. to speak. Uh, so the details are just used to make the main point, sometimes to amplify it. Mm-hmm. But the details we don't necessarily need to take literally. Uh, it is a parable, and mm-hmm. they're not the main point of the story. All right. So something terrible is going to happen to people would would be the equivalent of saying they're being cut in two. Mm. But anyway, let's let's back up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, this this parable uh, follows Jesus is saying that no one knows the time of his coming. Right. And and we in order to prepare for that coming, we need to be ready. And mm-hmm. there are parables about being ready for him. And one of these parables is teaching, this one is teaching about being a faithful servant and being prepared for the master's return. Mm -hmm. Now, the master servant uh, language makes us think of Jesus as master, of course, and we don't know when Mm -hmm. he's coming back, but servants as those who are looking for his coming. Right. So I take it as uh, some people want to make this the Jewish thing, but since Jesus predicted the church and Mm -hmm. because, um, uh, he is coming back at the rapture, which is, I believe this is a reference to, we don't know when that is. Right. See, if this was the second coming of Christ and he's talking to the Jews about the second coming of Christ, that doesn't, it, I know a lot of people, good friends that hold that view, but the problem is if it's the second coming of Christ, you could calculate when that's going to be. You yeah. could calculate from the time of the tribulation to three and a, uh, seven years later. Mm-hmm. And so it wouldn't be a surprise uh, because the Jews have those scriptures in Daniel Mm -hmm. and um, and they could remember the Olivet Discourse for that matter. Right. So the second coming of Christ is not the timing of it's not a big surprise, but the rapture is an eminent event, meaning that there's nothing that predicts it or nothing that that prelude preclude preludes it. Mm -hmm. Uh, He can come at any time. Right. So um, when he's talking here about the unfaithful servant who's not ready i think he's talking to believers okay and also a clue is in verse 48 where he mm-hmm. says uh uh for everyone to whom much is given to him much will be required to whom much has been committed of him they will ask the more mm-hmm. so something has been committed to these people to these servants and something has been given to them so they're not unbelievers in my opinion they're they're believers if he uses that kind of language right the question he's answering in verse 42 is uh who then is that faithful and wise servant Mm. whom his master will make ruler over his household okay to give them their portion of food in due season the question is about who is faithful and wise and who's going to get the reward of of being a ruler not in the household but a ruler in the household and get a portion of food so the idea of portion indicates that he's talking about a reward here. Um, and so that la- language fits believers as well. Uh, when it comes to the faithful servant, of course, 
um, he is uh, he is rewarded. Um, let's see. Blessed, he says, blesses the servant who finds his master, whom his master will find doing when he comes, and he will make him ruler over all that he has. Mm -hmm. So that that's uh, that uh, uh, parallels other passages that talk about those who are faithful ruling over kingdoms in, in right. uh, Matthew 25 and other places as well. Mm -hmm. But the one who delays uh, the one, the servant who says in his heart, my master is delaying is coming, begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink right. and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day that he is not looking for him. So he's going to be surprised. Mm -hmm. And that servant uh, didn't prepare himself, according to verse 47, mm -hmm. and he'll be beaten with many stripes. All right. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. So there's proportional punishment as mm. well there's not okay. just one punishment of being thrown into a lake of fire uh, it shows that there's degrees now to me mm -hmm. this indicates that there are degrees of reward and the loss of reward at the judgment okay. that all christians will face which brings in this whole subject of the judgment seat of christ at the judgment seat of christ we will be rewarded unequally and some mm -hmm. will be denied rewards more than others Mm -hmm. uh, on the basis of how they did i take it as a description of that judgment seat of christ where some will suffer greater loss than others mm -hmm. will jesus actually beat them that's that's one of the details i don't think we need to take literally the right. point is is that there's going to be bad news there's going to be consequences and um and when it talks about cutting them in two mm -hmm. and what verse is that in 46 46 yeah um oh yeah he will cut them in two and appoint them a portion with unbelievers okay there's mm -hmm. two issues here first of all where else in the scriptures do we see that jesus if these are talking about unsaved people where else in the scriptures do we see jesus cutting people in half we don't see that anymore All right so i take it as a figure of speech to emphasize this point that the judgment on them is going to be severe even the mm. third believers Right. But he says in verse 46 in the New King James Version, he yeah. appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Mm -hmm. So some people will say, well, see, he's talking about unbelievers because he's given the same portion that they will. However, the word unbeliever here is from the word pistos, which means faith or pistua, which means to believe. Mm -hmm. And but it's in the plural. And it can it not only means to uh, and it, and it's negated by the 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 letter alpha in front of it or a pistuo. Okay. So it's sometimes translated unbeliever, but it could also be translated as unfaithful, mm -hmm. as many translations of Second Timothy two thirteen would translate it. If we we're unfaithful, mm -hmm. yet he is faithful. The same word is used there. So unbelievers doesn't necessarily re refer to those who don't know Christ. It can just refer to un faithful believers and we know from experience from the scriptures and from parables that there are like the parable of the talents that there are unfaithful believers right so the one who's not anticipating the lord's return is not ready for him he's going to be his lot will be cast in with all the other unfaithful believers and their punishment will or their be severe if we want to call it a punishment they will they will suffer some grievous consequence that will feel like being cut in two <laughs> uh it won't it won't yeah. be pleasant so the main point of the parable is be ready because there are consequences for christ's return so this would be more like a hyperbole if you will yeah hyperbole yeah that's a good good figure of speech to use here but we don't want to make it walk on all fours again because right where else does Jesus cut people in two, right? believers or unbelievers? So really, so if this is a parable and we're trying to figure out what is the main point Jesus is getting across, would you say it's a matter of serving and being watchful for his coming? Because if you're like this guy, then you're going to lose all the rewards you stored up. What Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, Daniel, I think that's what I would say. 
Yeah, and that would be very grievous for somebody at the judgment seat of Christ to see what they're losing. Right. The question always is, is how long are they grieved? I don't know. I don't think it lasts for eternity. I don't think it lasts through the millennium right. period necessarily. Right. But there, there is some shame at his coming, First John 2, 28. And there is loss mm-hmm. uh, of rewards. So all of those are clearly taught in the scripture. We just don't know how how long the grief will last. Right. I appreciate how you articulating the fact that there are degrees here because the first one was a good servant. The second one is one that was drunk and didn't care less. And then the third one is one that just didn't do what he knew he should do. And so there's these degrees, levels of discipleship, if you will, and some people that aren't a disciple. Yeah. Uh, It's not binary saved or unsaved. Right. If it's like, especially if it's talking to believers, it's talking about degrees of consequences. Well, I saved the most fun question for last. Yeah. Are you okay with it? I'm okay with it, although prophecy isn't my strongest suit because that's not I, I don't devote a lot of time studying it because people ask me to speak about other things, but we'll try. <laughs> this is one that's interesting to me. Uh really. So let me give a little background on this. Now I've asked many people that I interview, I'm starting to ask this particular question because I've never heard this view before. But again, uh I've only been a Christian for Man, who not very long, you know, less than 10 years, I want to say, maybe. Mm-hmm. No, it's more than 10 years, 2007. Anyways, uh, Are you doing well, but I have uh, heard this view that unbelievers, unbelievers will be able to enter, live through the tribulation period and enter into the millennial kingdom. And so there are some good people that I really trust and like, and, you know, they hold it to this view and it could be right. I don't know. i would never heard of it. So I started looking into it and then I come across Daniel chapter 12 and basically Daniel chapter 12, verse number 11 and 12, 11, it says, and from the time the daily sacrifice or oblation is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there will be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. And then in verse 12, Daniel writes, blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1,335th day. And so my question is, there's a specific blessing that is pronounced in verse number 12 for those people who endured and waited until day 1,335 from, uh, I want to say, the middle of the tribulation period. There's a specific blessing in that they will literally be able to enter into the millennial kingdom. Now, my question is, who do you believe the people are that will enter into the millennial kingdom at the end of the tribulation period? Are they just believers? Are they believers and unbelievers? What are your thoughts in this 75-day interval? Does that play any role into it? I think the 75 day interval leaves some guessing as to what's going to happen in that period. But I, I take it that that could be the time of uh, uh, the great white throne judgment is taking place. um, And uh, maybe um, the tribulation martyrs, old Testament saints are resurrected and so forth. Okay. Uh, I'll get there in a second, but Mm -hmm. the, the special blessing for those who, uh, persist to the 13 thir- 25 days i take it that their blessing is that uh, they just have to wait that long to get into the kingdom i think you mm-hmm. said that but i don't know if that's exactly what you meant mm-hmm. but um so the blessing will be at the end of those 1335 days that they'll enter the kingdom uh will unbelievers enter the kingdom i don't know who teaches that or what argument they use mm-hmm. so if you want to explain that you can but from my understanding, there are uh, there's a series of resurrections called the first resurrection. First of all, would be the rapture of Christians from the earth mm-hmm. when we're transformed, and then the tribulation martyrs are raised. Revelation chapter twenty, and and many believe the Old Testament saints are raised at that time also. Mm-hmm. Uh, Daniel twelve two talks about uh, the two resurrections, right? Destruction one to everlasting life, and then there's the sheep and the goats judgment that that could take place in this period of time mm-hmm. also um and the gentiles are thrown into the lake of fire so i don't know who that leaves that is an unbeliever if all the believers are resurrected 
and mortality can't inherit immortality according to first corinthians 15 mm -hmm. then i don't see how a believer can inherit or enter the kingdom of god however there are unbelievers in the kingdom of god mm -hmm. because we know uh, that there's a rebellion later on mm -hmm. at the end of the tribulation uh, i mean at the end of the millennial period right where uh, satan is released and seduces a lot of people to follow him who would those unbelievers believe be i mm -hmm. think they are the offspring of believers who go into the millennial kingdom in their mm -hmm. natural bodies who are alive at the time that the kingdom is established right they go in in their natural bodies they have children children are talked about in uh, um, isaiah 11 isaiah 65 mm -hmm. and children are born and it, and it mentions some dying under a curse mm -hmm. so in zechariah 14 17 i believe also so there will be unbelievers in the millennial kingdom they will suffer the curse when jesus puts down the rebellion mm -hmm. um, but they didn't enter that way is the way i understand it right um Zechariah 12 10 talks about Israel will all be saved when they see the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Romans eleven twenty six 26 says all Israel will be saved. Mm -hmm. And then, and then Matthew 25 and the parable of the sheep and the goats, only the sheep will be there. So I don't know how that leaves any unbelievers entering the kingdom. I guess, I guess part of uh, one of the arguments I've heard made is that at the end of the tribulation period, what should we call it? that it, it seems as though there will still be unbelievers uh, at that point uh, when Jesus Christ comes back at the second at the second coming and so unless Jesus Christ just kills them all right then and there then they would be able to enter in but i'm looking at the sheep and the goat judgment and how they treated the jewish people like you said very well earlier on and the fact that i look at that's when that judgment's taking place where the goats are cast off like you said they were unbelievers before in that i only ever read that believers will be able to enter into the kingdom i never read anything about an unbeliever but it's just a question that something that i'm starting to study a little more because i've heard uh, that opposing view and like i said there's people that i love and i trust you know that that have heard it and and are holding on to some form of it. And I'm just trying to be a brand and, and see what I believe scripture says, and then sure. ask people that are more along than I am, what they think as well and see how many people believe with me. <laughs> so <laughs> well, I would, I would be interested in the arguments for unbelievers entering the kingdom. Yet, like you said, there are unbelievers when Jesus returns. I agree with that. But then the Bible talks about him vanquishing all his enemies yeah. and bringing destruction on everybody who doesn't believe. So yep. I think it's a pretty thorough, uh and completed uh, well i'm just i'm waiting to find back from uh verses that are used to teach that view i know with that aspect when all the nations are gathered together against jesus uh it's a reference to the nations per se and, and they won't hold that that means every unbeliever just that the nations will be against jesus and that's one way they'll argue against that but it's interesting. However, I'm just waiting word, to hear verses. The word nations, I think, is the eth ethne, ethnos. and that yep. refers ethnos yep. refers to people. Yep, that too. Yeah. And so you got just the ethnic people. So, but yeah. that's uh, that's it for today. I appreciate your time for answering. You know, a lot of these, you know, most often asked questions, misunderstood verses, and just how you're able to clearly articulate the difference between understanding a, a salvific passage and a discipleship passage. One that means eternal life is free, and one that means that if we work, it's for rewards or, or loss of rewards uh, as well. And so as we button this up, is there any final words you'd like to share before we uh, tell, tell everybody goodbye? Yeah. Whoo. Those were tough questions. <laughs> well, you got a THM and a PhD from DTS and an AHC and an ABC and a. <laughs> I might have a lot of letters, but I don't have the best memory in the world. So <laughs> questions forced me to go back and look at some of my notes, to be honest with you. That's fine. And, we're going to uh, link all your thing. books. You know, you study everything, but you don't always remember everything. And I don't focus on everything in yep. my ministry. So. Some things that uh, I have to go back and sharpen up on, but appreciate what you're doing, Daniel, and getting the word out and getting the message of God's grace out. That's very important work. And uh, thanks for having me on. And God bless you as you continue to uh, work with your podcast and YouTube channel. I hope you get a lot of followers. 
Definitely appreciate that. We're going to get links to Grace Life Ministry in the description, as well as the books that you have that really talk on a lot of these topic, topics and verses. So it's for everybody else. Thanks for checking it out. And God bless.